Give us the Welcome to the Health and Human Services Finance Committee. We uh, do not yet have a quorum, but we are going to begin testimony. We are going to be hearing testimony on the governor's finance bill, and uh, we will be moving through the testifiers uh, as they come in. And if we could have Amy Donan come to the testifiers table, we will begin. Hello. Oh, God, somebody his own. Okay. That is right there. You can uh, state your name for the record into the microphone and begin. And just so folks know, we're going to probably we have a lot of folks signed up to testify, so we're going to be trying to keep testimony from two to three minutes. So, to the extent that you can kind of do that, that would be great. And we'll uh, remind folks when you're kind of at that at the uh, two and three minute mark. Uh, so that you can adjust and uh, and in between testifiers we'll go ahead and kick the meeting off when we have a quorum and get our business uh, taken care of. So please uh, state your name for the record and begin with your testimony. My name is Amy Donnan. I work as a psychologist for the Leech Lake Band of Ojibwe, Jikazakog Jimikig, behavioral health, representing wellness in a Dizawin. And I'm here to testify as to the effectiveness that um, grant money we received four years ago had on the Leech Lake <coughs> Reservation serving children ages five and under. That grant money allowed us to create a program that did not exist. That program serves children five and under and their families in collaboration, which is the key piece, because we're asking you today to keep that money protected and those programs protected because the collaboration that we were allowed to do with Head Start teachers, special education staff, medical professionals, spiritual advisors, child welfare caseworkers allowed us to basically create more bang for the buck, so to speak, when we're talking about building foundations of children and also building foundations in our communities. I can't speak to the research that what I'm going to tell you um, draws from. It, I draw from 20 years of experience training that I was able to receive through the San Francisco Trauma Research Center in collaborations with the San Francisco General Hospital, the University of Minnesota Child Attachment Study, and other sources that I've come across along the way, both addressing theory and intervention. So today we're really here to speak for the children because let's face it, if we want strong financial communities, and this is based on research, we want to see this rather than this. If I were a contractor, you could say that I help provide the core materials for the foundation of a home or help repair the cracks. So I'm asking us together to provide more of this, more good, rich soil in the form of this money that will allow me as a clinician to leave the office, to get on the phone, to talk to key people and to, to really saturate my efforts and my knowledge so that teachers like these Head Start teachers in 13 communities and over 30 classrooms on the Leech Lake Reservation provide not only basic ABC foundation, but the foundation of social emotional learning. These teachers, by the way, are brilliant. I learned as much from them, which is important, as I was able to provide key points for them to help, specifically a little boy that I'll tell you about. These are some of my colleagues. When I began four years ago, there were three of us. There's now 37. Again, we're not talking about behavioral management. We're talking about what's under the surface. If we can provide strength, we have moral compasses. We have clear thinking. We have emotional management. We have an airport mechanic who pays attention to his job. We have a teacher who can inspire. We have a doctor who doesn't make mistakes in the operating room. And as I get into my 50s, we have someone who can take care of us as we age. So we want to build strong people, strong communities. And that's how we do it. We address and use the research and skills that we've obtained in our efforts to provide supports for children. Now, if some of you are familiar with the ACE study, acestudy.org if you want more information. There's research out there that correlates with attachment research. We're not going to get into that. The ACE study 
predicts if you have a score of five or more adverse experiences as a child, you have a very high risk for mental health issues or medical problems as an adult. We want to prevent that, of course. That's both a financial motivator and just a life satisfaction motivator. I'm going to read you a story, and I want you to listen to this story in terms of what strengths this child is drawing from. This is a story written by uh, my friend's granddaughter. My friend lost her daughter in a fatal car accident December 18th, and her granddaughter wrote this for the funeral. I'm Elena Fox. I'm going to be talking about my mom. My mom was the best mom in the world, and she still is. She was there for me when I got hurt. She helped me through tough times. She helped me with projects, and most of all, she helped me with my math. <laughs> One word my mom always loved was the word love. She used the word love a lot. She used it on her mom, her grandparents, her stepdad, Jace, which is her brother, me, and most of all, my dad. She loves my dad more than anything. I know that with my dad and brother, I can get through this tough time. Life gives us tough challenges to face, and this is one of them. I know I can face this with my family. One of my dad's sayings is never give up, and I'm not going to give up now. My mom will always be with me in my heart, protecting me. One person my mom loved most of all was my dad. She would give anything to see my dad, and so would he. But like I said, I'm not going to give up because if my mom was here, she would say the same thing. And I know I can face this with my mom in my heart, still loving me. One of the other phrases that this little girl's mom used to say was, come on, honey, you can do it. You're not an American, you're an American. Again, strong foundation. I'll wrap up with, fat, with the fact that most of the children we serve have A scores of six. They cannot draw upon something that was not given to them. So we have to work together to provide it. I've been working with a now three-year-old who was under two when we started. He was aggressive five times a day or more. He would try to topple over 32-inch TV screens and sometimes nearly succeeded. He had to be watched closely, and he refused book time in school. Remember those teachers? When we collaborated, what they did, recognizing that he did not have the calm inside of him yet, was they allowed him to take a dinosaur, and as long as he had a dinosaur book near him during book time, he could have the dinosaur instead. One year later, he's periodically aggressive, maybe five times a month, we're still working, and he reads books. Or like Amber said, we're helping erase the bad pictures in their hearts so they can have more love. That's her advice for what we're doing, because we're working with developmental complexity, things that have affected children, have affected their brains. The three-year-old I'm working with was abandoned at a homeless shelter and met his grandparents at the first time when they picked him up to adopt him. So, and that's just the tip of his iceberg. So whether you are protecting the financial strength of a community, whatever your passion is, recognize that this money, this funding protects your passion and mine as we protect children. Thank you, or as, yeah. And I think we're going to have to wrap up. Yep. Uh, but we do have additional information from you in the packets, I believe, that was passed out to folks. Yes. And so we do thank you for that. And this is one. Thank, thank you. Thank you. And next we have uh, Ms. Kathy Knight from Fairview Behavioral Health. Mr. Chair, members of the committee, thank you for the opportunity. My name is Kathy Knight and I'm the Vice President for Fairview Behavioral Health. We have 220 acute adult and pediatric inpatient beds and an array of outpatient and residential services making us one of the largest behavioral health providers in Minnesota. I'm also the chair, vice chair of the Minnesota Hospital Association's Mental and Behavioral Health Task Force. And I'm here today to support much of the gov governor's proposal and investment in mental health services and also to thank you for your work on this issue as well. The integration of primary care and behavioral health services through the creation and funding of behavioral health homes is a critical step in addressing the triple aims of improved clinical outcomes, patient experience, and cost containment. We strongly support this initiative. This care model 
will reduce expensive emergency department visits and hospitalizations for both physical and emotional crises often created by the ineffective management of chronic illness. But I want to spend most of my time emphasizing a topic today that does not often get addressed. While most adult patients with mental illness are more likely to be victimized than to injure others, there is a subset of patients who are extremely aggressive. These complex patients are the most difficult to serve and to discharge from our hospital care. Because our community lacks psychiatric residential programs capable of managing aggression, these patients have prolonged hospital stays in both state and community hospitals. We strongly support the development of psychiatric residential treatment facilities to provide a continuum of appropriate and safe care capable of managing aggression. This will then improve access to hospital beds and fill a deep gap in the continuum. Similarly, there is a group of adolescents who are complex, aggressive, <coughs> traumatized, and resent relentlessly self-harming. There is a proposal to close the child and adolescent beds at Wilmer and contract with community hospitals. It cannot be underestimated the intensive level of staffing, usually one-to-one -one for extended periods, and the specialized services required to care and treat these youngsters. The adult contracted bed model is inadequate. These youngsters require safe residential treatment programs in our community as well, capable of managing the intensity of their symptoms. We have recently placed two teenage girls in Indiana as they were rejected from all potential residential programs in our state due to their assaultive and self-injurious behaviors. New beds by themselves are not a solution. The failure to recognize and fund what it takes to safely care and treat these adults and adolescents whose behavior are very dangerous will not close the gap that exists today. Thank you. Thank you so much. We appreciate it. And if Erica Schmiel could be coming down from the Public Policy, so, or from the Brain In Injury Alliance, please. And then next up on deck, Maureen Warren from Lutheran Social Services. Thank you. Please state your name for the record and proceed. Good afternoon. My name is Erica Schmiel. I'm with the Minnesota Brain Injury Alliance. The Alliance is dedicated to serving the 100,000 Minnesotans who live with disability due to brain injury, their loved ones and the professionals who work with them. It is on their behalf I want to thank the committee for the opportunity to comment on the governor's budget. I agree with Commissioner Jessen's opening comments when she presented the Health and Human Service budget that we are fortunate to live in Minnesota. Adults with disabilities are thankful for the waiver services they receive through our state's medical assistance program because these services are essential to living independently in their communities. However, there is a hole in that medical assistance safety net. The qualifying income, asset, and spend down standards are way too low. They're forcing adults and seniors with disabilities deep into poverty to get those services they need to remain independent. We are disappointed that the governor's budget does nothing to address these low qualifying standards. They present a catch-22 for people like Joseph, who is afraid he may not be able to stay in a house he owns in Brooklyn Center because he has little money left when the state expects him to pay a $474 a month spend down every month for health care and services that are intended to help him stay in his house. And while the $3,000 asset standard excludes his house and his car, they are far too low for him to maintain either properly. We are also disappointed that the governor's budget doesn't include a repeal of the increase in the medical assistance for employed persons with disabilities, or MAEPD. This work incentive program is designed to allow persons with disabilities who are able to work from, to benefit from their earned income by paying a monthly premium for MA rather than having to spend down their income to $730 a month like Joseph does. The premium increase has placed thousands of adults with disabilities in desperate financial situations. They just can't afford it. Bev Joyce lives in Waite Park and her premium more than doubled last fall. She doesn't understand why, knowing how difficult it is for people with disabilities to get and keep employment, 
the state would raise her premium so much that she is now having trouble paying her bills. I look forward to sharing more stories with you when you hear legislation sponsored by Representative Albright to repeal the increase in the MAPD premium, as well as Representative Zerwas to increase the MA income, asset, and spend down standards for adults and seniors with disabilities. It's been 32 years since the MA asset limit was last raised. The time for MA reform is long overdue, and we are counting on the House to do what the governor failed to do and make it a budget priority this session. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. <clears throat> Next up, we have Ms. Warren. And Mr. Nelson on deck. Uh, Mr. Chairman, members of the committee, I'm happy to be here today. My name is Maureen Warren, and I'm the Chief Family Services Officer at Lutheran Social Service. And uh, we're having a very significant birthday this year. This year marks the 150th year that LSS has been serving Minnesota and caring for our neighbors. Today, we offer 23 different services in all 87 counties, and 75% of our work is in greater Minnesota. I want to start with the thank you and thank you for the very meaningful investments that were made last year in the 5% campaign and the Homeless Youth Act. Both of those will enable us to continue our 150 year legacy of serving Minnesotans in the community. The governor's proposal includes a home and community services based innovation pool. I'm sure you've committed it to memory. It appears on page 143, which is almost the last page. Um, and over the last two years, LSS has been working to implement an approach that we call My Life, My Choices, a model that encourages people with disabilities to design the life they choose to live in the community. And now we are partnering with five of our fellow disability services providers and a health care provider to create an accountable care organization, or ACO. The vision, and we've named it, Altair. The vision of the Altair ACO is for Minnesotans with disabilities to live as independently as possible in community, making choices that affect their own lives and contributing back to their community. We're eager to apply for the innovation pool opportunity and demonstrate an incentive model that utilizes a life planning process that encourages community independence and employment as required by the Olmstead plan. Uh, we would be um, one of uh, several people that would be eligible to compete. We've studied models across the country and we're pretty confident that this would represent the first in the nation incentive for community service providers to offer less intensive working and living arrangements that could bend and reduce the cost curve. At LSS, the 5% increase that you awarded last year, 100% of it went to the wages and, ex and employee expenses for our direct support staff. When I met with our managers from all across the state, they wanted to be sure that we said thank you, but they also wanted to tell me that the harsh reality is even as you voted that increase last year, with the Minnesota economy improving, which is good news, and uh, less than a 4% unemployment rate, that we're even more challenged to attract and retain a quality and consistent workforce. Our managers want to spend their time offering the opportunity to move people into more independent lives, but instead they find them themselves spending time filling shifts themselves because of high turnover. It's critical that we continue to invest in the current system so individuals receiving services today will receive high quality care, even while we test new ways of doing things tomorrow. Uh, the governor's proposal for making group residential housing more portable will, also, will increase independence greatly and the historic investments adding to mental health services um, are something we also support. So uh, I want to thank you and uh, look forward to working with you throughout the session. Thank you for your testimony. And next up we have uh, Mr. Nelson from ARM. <coughs> Welcome to the committee. Thank you, Mr. Chair, members of the committee. I am Bruce Nelson with ARM. We're a statewide association of disability providers uh, serving people in the disability waivers and ICFDD. And I'm uh, very proud to say that we've been working with uh, many of you over the years uh, to make the vision of Olmstead a reality. And I, I'll mention a couple of those along the way. I have six quick things. One, the transition to community fund. Uh, is a very uh, another important step to in helping people move out of institutions and into the community. Uh, we support this effort and we look forward to working with you and others as that moves ahead. Uh, the housing and supportive services for people with disabilities just referred to 
that's a bringing together of a group residential housing and shelter needy uh, program which uh, just a few years ago Representative Schumacher in his blueprint for reform bill that we worked with him on uh, began doing combining those two programs to make housing and the funding for housing more accessible to people who want to move out of a group home. Uh, this is another important step and we want to make sure that we don't lose the good things uh, as we move forward on that. Um, the uh, previous testifier talked about the ACO, the uh, Services uh, Innovation Pool. Uh, we salute all innovators and want to be working with them. But also be careful that we're not adding another layer of cost or administration as we move ahead. Uh, but it's an exciting development. One thing that's not uh, in the jurisdiction of this com uh, committee is broadband. And the governor puts $30 million into broadband. If we are going to, uh, to internet access across the state, if we're going to uh, move forward with, with the vision of Olmstead, it's very important that that be available and for innovators as well to meet the needs of people wherever they want to live uh, and across the state of Minnesota. Two things that aren't in the governor's budget. Um, You've heard about the 5% campaign last year and this year, and uh, many of you uh, have signed on to uh, a, another rate increase for home and community-based services that's so desperately needed as we, our caregivers uh, lag behind uh, the cost of living. And uh, as the economy gets better, you, as you just heard, it's uh, ever more difficult to, uh, to keep really good people who want to stay. So uh, thank you for those of you, Representative Hamilton, the chief author, and others who have signed on to that, on to that bill and look forward to uh, working with you on, on a rate increase. And finally, a minimum wage that you adopted last year, some of you voted for. Uh, in our industry, people who get minimum wage are paid to sleep. And uh, those are folks overnight. And if it's not funded, it's really a cost drain than on other caregivers who are up and awake. And my time is up. And you will be seeing a bill uh, later this uh, session uh, to address that issue. And I thank you so very much. Thank you. Uh, next up, we have Steve Larson from the ARC. <coughs> Welcome to the committee. Mr. Chair and committee members, I'm Steve Larson with the ARC Minnesota. And um, I don't want to sound too redundant, but I want to thank you uh, as the former co-chair of the 5% campaign for your increase there. And the previous testifiers have articulated why that's so important that we continue with that campaign this year. However, this year I'm having to spend my time on several other bills, which I'll be outlining here after I review the governor's <coughs> budget. The governor's budget uh, has strong mental health reforms, and these impact persons with intellectual and developmental disabilities, two-thirds of which uh, will at some point in their life suffer, uh, some are uh, be impacted by a mental health issue and need to access those services. So we fully endorse uh, the reforms that are in that area. We also fully endorse uh, what the governor has as far as his reform for group residential housing and MSA housing assistance. The ARC Minnesota has been fortunate for the past five years to have a housing access services contract with the state of Minnesota. It's state funded dollars uh, and this program has helped 1,200 individuals find places of their own where their name is on the lease. But we are being impacted by the increasing costs of rental and if we're going to continue to allow uh, individuals to self-direct in their housing, we need this type of increase, which is on the governor's budget on page uh, 84. We also support uh, the funding for the Olmstead office, because if we are going to implement the uh, vision of Olmstead, uh, we need that office to be strong. We have several concerns of areas that are not in the governor's budget that we think would help with the implementation of Olmstead. And the number one uh, issue that we're working on this legislative session is funding for the State Quality Council. And we're going to have a bill that will be chief authored by Representative Hamilton. Uh, so hopefully that uh, it will be a companion uh, with the 5% bill uh, if we want to have a quality component in that uh, bill as it moves forward. Despite the Jensen court settlement and the Olmstead plan, we still do not have a quality improvement system that's comprehensive across the state of Minnesota that gives a voice to persons with disabilities about whether they're receiving the services and supports and the outcomes that they want. And we need to get that funded and we need to have that in place and the State Quality Council is the vehicle to do that. 
We will also be working on legislation to address the waiting list. Um, a report came out this past year that identified that counties are leaving on the table 7 to 10 percent of reserves in their waiver budget. So we're spending billions of dollars, but we're not spending enough money to meet the waiting list. There's 5,000 Minnesotans with disabilities on our waiting list, waiting list for all of our waivers, and we will be uh, proposing some legislation we think will help uh, with the management of that program so that we can eliminate the waiting list. We will be introducing a number of bills on uh, self-directed supports and consumer-directed community supports, as well as parental fees, and we endorse the testimony of Erica Schmiel from the Brain Injury Association on the MA Income and Asset Standards. Thank you for your time, and I look forward to talking to you about all of these bills in the future. Thank you, Mr. Larson. Uh, Ms. Anderson from CDF is next, followed on deck by uh, Lauren Solberg. Hi. Welcome to the committee. Thank you. Good afternoon, Mr. Chair and members of the committee. My name is Jessica Anderson. I'm the Legislative Affairs Director for Children's Defense Fund Minnesota. Thank, thank you for allowing me to testify today on the governor's budget. Uh, the Children's Defense Fund, along with a growing number of organization and organizations, and some of them are in the room here today, they include Legal Aid, Isaiah, the Minnesota Budget Project, and Catholic Charities, were members of the Kids Can't Wait Coalition, which is a new coalition and a growing coalition uh, that's dedicated to making child care more affordable and accessible for Minnesota families with a focus on increasing affordability and access for those families with lower incomes. We know that child care benefits all Minnesotans. It's a two-generation approach to broader economic security because it allows parents to work and provide for their families and children to succeed in safe, nurturing environments. Child care is also a workforce development issue. It supports the creation of a strong current and future workforce, which is essential to uh, the future economy of our state. The Kids Can't Wait Coalition advocates for three things. Firstly, increasing funding for basic sliding fee child care assistance. Number two, increasing reimbursement rates for child care providers participating in the child care assistance program. And number three, improving the state's child and dependent care tax credit. We are pleased that Governor Dayton has taken a first step toward making child care more affordable and accessible for Minnesota families by recommending an expanded child care tax credit and increased funding for basic sliding fee. While we support expanding the child care tax credit to help more low and moderate income families afford child care, we encourage lawmakers to support a more targeted proposal um, to help free up resources that could then be applied to basic sliding fee child care assistance. Governor Dayton's proposal also included $12.5 million for the biennium to help reduce the basic sliding fee wait list. Um, however, with more than 6,000 families on the wait list for the program and more who are eligible, we hope that lawmakers will build on the proposal and further increase our state's commitment. And lastly, though not included in the governor's budget, we also encourage legislators to fund an increase in the reimbursement rate to child care assistance accepting providers. Um, you may know that the reimbursement rate has eroded over the past 10 years to the point that now two-thirds of provider rates in our state are not covered by the reimbursement, which means we're asking those providers to take these families at a financial loss. So uh, in conclusion, we hope that this committee in particular will join us in supporting an increased commitment to CCAP. We believe that investing in CCAP is a wise investment in children, families, and the future of prosperity of our state. Thank you. Thank you. And Lauren Solberg is next. Welcome to the committee, Mr. Solberg. Good afternoon, Mr. Chairman, and it's good to be here. Thank you for uh, allowing us to, to testify today. My name is, is Lauren Solberg, and I'm here today representing Itasca County in place of Becky Lauer, who could not be here. Itasca County is a little bit far north, and it's kind of tough for them to come down for a two-minute um, session with you. So you have, you're stuck with me, I'm sorry. She is a manager of the Family and Child Service Division of Itasca County Health and Human Services and I will share her thoughts on the issue of the new child protection uh, proposals that are being developed. Family assessments cannot be eliminated. We need the option of not, not to have every case go to court. We have been successful working in Itasca County and other counties w working voluntarily with families to solve family issues. Creating more staff at DHS does nothing to assist counties with the actual social workers 
and no resources, that is money, to increase our staff capability, we will fall farther behind in meeting expectations already set by DHS, not to mention those that may be developed as a result of the task force. Our system cannot support the recommendation that every case have law enforcement and county attorneys involvement. And requiring more training for direct staff and supervisors in theory is a good plan. However, if the training is offered in the metro only, outstate counties cannot afford monetarily or time-wise the commitment to send all staff to the mandatory training. Counties need state resources to make sure that children are protected. I'll highlight a couple of other issues as well. We are pleased that the governor has recommended no cuts to the SHIP program. <coughs> Counties are also pleased that the governor's budget recognizes the importance of programs administered by public health and has a recommendation for a 10% increase. However, the huge cuts to the public health program that were made in 2003 have continued to be very difficult for counties. Our area has three counties, Aiken, Itasca, and Kuchiching, that cooperatively administer the public health programs. Their allocation in 2003 was $757,000. It was cut to $546,000, a loss of about $211,000. In 2014, 11 years later, the allocation from the state has increased only $28,000. With the renewed pressure uh, that the public health organizations face, we are seeking at least a restoration to the level of funding before the cuts of 2003. Just another little note on mental health <coughs> issues. Itasca County Sheriff was called to rescue a gentleman who was mentally ill and threatening suicide. A jail was not an appropriate place for this person. They tried to find a hospital bed in Itasca <laughs> County or in northern Minnesota. Nothing was available. The closest one was uh, Rochester, Minnesota. Closing up, any help that this committee and legislature can give to counties to fund the state mandated programs will be greatly appreciated. We look forward to working with the committee and the legislature to strengthen the partnership that exists between the counties and the state. Thank you very much for the opportunity to be before your committee. And Mr. Chairman, I have voided this committee many, many times. <laughs> well, we're very glad you're here with us today, Represent or Mr. Solberg. And next we have uh, Dr. Rick Lee from Woodland Mental Health. <laughs> Mr. Chair, members of the committee, I am not Dr. Rick Lee. He's a lot more handsome than I am, but uh, my name is Claire Wilson. I am the Executive Director of the Minnesota Association of Community Mental Health Programs. Dr. Rick Lee, who is our current past president, board member, and CEO of Woodland Centers in Wilmer, Minnesota, did his best to be here today, but the snow has totally delayed him, and he sends his apologies. We really wanted a rural provider to speak in front of you today, so I am speaking on his behalf and on behalf of the association. The Minnesota Association of Community Mental Health Programs exists to fulfill its mission of improving access to and quality of behavioral health care in Minnesota. Our members serve more than 150,000 Minnesotans of all ages from all corners of the state who suffer from mental illness and serious emotional disturbance. As an association of providers, both rural and metro, we are grateful for the attention mental health has received in the governor's budget proposal. For context, mental illness insufficiently treated is placing enormous stress on the quality and cost of our health care system. Of the highest utilizers of health care broadly defined, people with mental illness are overrepresented by orders of magnitude. Unless we get our arms around the health of people with mental illness, we are neither going to bend our health care cost curve nor improve our population health. Two elements of the governor's budget proposal are especially important in this regard the establishment of behavioral health homes, which you can find on page 42, and support for Minnesota's application to be one of the eight selected demonstration states under the Federal Excellence in Mental Health Care Act. Both of these proposals aim squarely at an end cost effective fashion, improving the overall health of people with mental illness. These proposals call on mental health providers to create greater access to an array of services, ranging from wellness and education to crisis services and everything in between but perhaps most importantly to require effective coordination with primary and specialty medical care. They represent a significant stride forward in improving the quality and cost efficiency of services to Minnesotans with mental illness, 
many of whom suffer from chronic health conditions. They aim to improve the quality of life of these Minnesotans and in doing so enhance their recovery from mental illness and help them to achieve their goal of being productive citizens in their communities. We also urge support of the governor's proposal to stabilize the rate structure for some key community-based mental health services. All members of the association are nonprofits and operate on very thin margins. The sudden closure of River Road Centers last year threw 3,000 plus Minnesotans out of mental health services that for many meant the difference between staying in their homes versus needing a higher level of care. Woodland Centers, the agency Dr. Lee represents, closed their intensive residential treatment program last year in large part because of these financial challenges. For most community mental health providers, every dollar spent to deliver psychiatric services results in a reimbursement of 40 cents. This state of affairs is not sustainable and reform is desperately needed. We look forward to working with you all on building the current structure of Minnesota's mental health system. Thanks. Thank you for being with us today. And next up, we have Ms. Yang from Community Mental Health from the Wilder Foundation. Welcome to the committee. Thank you. I was waiting to see how you'd pronounce that name. Yang? <laughs> Pahua. Oh, Miss Yang. <laughs> That's how I pronounce it. <laughs> you pronounce it very well. So good afternoon, Mr. Chair. Welcome and, to the um, Members of the committee, my name is Pahua Yang, and I'm the director of community mental health um, at the Wilder Foundation, a nonprofit health and human service organization here in St. Paul. Um, I'm here to express my heartfelt support for the mental health proposals in the governor's budget. At Wilder, we strive to be a trauma-informed and culturally competent mental health provider for children and adults who are experiencing mental health concerns. And I'd like to talk about three of the proposals included in the governor's budget that support these efforts. Our programs at Wilder serve um, people from various communities who've experienced severe trauma and are tackling with really complex mental health conditions. Mental health funding is an investment in people, families, and communities. And many of our families need access to the kinds of resources that will help them lead full and productive lives, a right that all of us in this room share. And for this reason, we are particularly invested in the governor's proposal to build community capacity to address adverse childhood experiences. This is the kind of prevention and early intervention centered legislation that will support the needs of families throughout the state. We are also an avid support of the proposal to stabilize the mental health services payment structure as the current rates are simply inadequate. This is long overdue and in dire need of attention. For example, currently the demand for psychiatrists throughout the state, especially for child psychiatrists, is drastically higher than the supply. Parents often end up desperately calling around for someone who will see their child. And for many of the folks that we serve at the Wilder Foundation who are often underinsured, uninsured, or on medical assistance, it's even tougher to get in to see a psychiatrist because many organizations are forced to limit the available step spots for our families. They are often left with limited or extremely expensive options such as using an emergency room. Over the years I've spoken to lots of parents who are just grateful that I'm returning their phone call and that I'm saying things like, yes, I can put your child in our system, you know, we have a wait list, but I'll keep calling you, and then they're surprised when I keep calling them. It's crucial that the current payment and support structures are critically assessed and changed in order to build and support an increase in the community psychiatrists as proposed through the addition of the psychiatry slot at the U of M's medical school. Other bills that we hope to see supported address the certification of behavioral health clinics and funding to implement behavioral health homes. These are the kinds of wraparound services that we have seen enormous success from, and we are encouraged by the potential that these supports have to impact our communities. Thank you very much for your time today. Thank you for your testimony. And next up, we have Jessica Webster from Prosperity for All Coalition. Welcome to the committee. 
Thank you, Mr. Chair and members. My name is Jessica Webster. I'm a staff attorney with Legal Aid and also co-chair of the Prosperity for All Coalition. This is a coalition of 70 organizations who are speaking on behalf of the 70,000 low-income children in the Minnesota Family Investment Program. So uh, there's good things in this budget that you will hear about today. Uh, our coalition is disappointed that this is the fifth year that there has been no increase to the cash assistance grant in the Minnesota Family Investment Program. For a family of three, this grant stays at uh, $532, which is the same $532 that it was in 1986. That $532 is expected to cover rent, transportation, utilities, and other basic needs for families, and it's just not. It is just not covering. And our coalition is very, very focused on helping families get stable, get skills, get education and training, get a higher paying job, and to leave this program and never, ever look back. And that is the goal of our coalition. That's the goal of the campaign. And we just feel like we cannot get there when families are living homeless and not able to uh, get to their jobs and cover transportation costs and we're keeping them at a deep, deep, abject poverty level on this grant. We've now fallen uh, about $121 below Wisconsin, uh, over $70 below South Dakota, and we're at like 38th in the nation in terms of the worst erosion in our TANF grant, uh, so nationwide. So we would, we, um, we hope that the governor, if uh, some funding allows, will maybe uh, remember this in the supplemental budget. And we're very pleased that there is bipartisan support in the House, significant bipartisan support, to look at increasing this grant this year. Thank you very much. Thank you for your testimony. Next up, we have Anna Ashby from Catholic Charities. Welcome to the committee. Thank you, Mr. Chair and members. I'm Anna Ashby. I'm the public policy advocate at Catholic Charities of St. Paul in Minneapolis. Catholic Charities is the largest comprehensive social service provider in the region, and we serve tens of thousands of people each year, from prenatal care through aging services, the vast majority of whom live in poverty. One of our sites is the Northside Child of Child Development Center in North Minneapolis, where we offer child care and early childhood education programs to low-income families who work hard to foster a healthy and stable environment in which children can thrive. All families at Northside qualify for the Child Care Assistance Program, or CCAP. You've heard, from, you've heard from other testifiers about the importance of child care, and I'd like to share the story of a couple of our clients with you. Akila is a young single mom who lives in North Minneapolis with her daughter, Nyla. Last fall, she was working full time at a money transfer company and worked as many overtime hours as she was able, needing the extra income to help support her small family. But in November, she got a letter from the county notifying her that she'd have to start paying the full cost of childcare on her own, changing her monthly contribution to Northside from $300 a month to $1,300 a month instantly, despite the fact that her income had not grown to anywhere near a level that would allow her to absorb such a jump in cost. The basic sliding fee program, which Governor Dayton included some funding for in his budget, is designed to help families in such situations. As income increases modestly, the basic sliding fee is meant to help them transition to paying the full cost of childcare to avoid jumps in costs like the one Akila faced. We encourage the legislature to build on the governor's investment in the basic sliding fee program so that parents like her never have to worry that working just a few hours of overtime at a low-wage job might increase their child care costs by $12,000 a year. We'd also like to voice support for housing supports for adults with serious mental illness and bridges. These programs help us serve over 1,000 people a night in emergency shelter and permanent housing at sites like the Dorothy Day Center and at Higher Ground. We encourage the legislature to build on the governor's proposal to ensure that all Minnesotans have access to safe and stable housing. We've also been providing ongoing input to DHS on reforms to group residential housing and are very pleased that the governor included funding for GRH reform initiatives in his proposal. One area of concern that we'd like to echo is that the governor's budget proposal for the fifth year in a row does not include an increase to the cash grant under the Minnesota Family Investment Program. As a provider that interacts with the families on MFIP daily, we strongly support and respectfully request that you consider such an increase. As you know, the cash grant has not increased for all families using MFIP since 1986, which was three years before I was born, and the buying power of the cash grant has been cut in half. 
An increase in assistance of just $100 a month would help meet the needs of 30,000 households as they re-enter the workforce and help the 70,000 children for whom these parents care. We urge you to con continue to consider the needs of very low-income families and individuals like Akila and Nyla. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony. Next up, we have Mary Regan from the Minnesota Council of Child Caring Services. <coughs> and next up, we have Michael Scandrett on deck. Thank Welcome to the committee. <coughs> Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chair and committee members. My name is Mary Regan. I'm the Executive Director of the Minnesota Council of Child Caring Agencies statewide association of providers of treatment and intervention services for children and families in the child welfare, juvenile justice, mental health, and homeless youth systems. Um, uh, we echo a lot of the support that's been expressed today for many of the provisions in the governor's budget. Um, and I'm just going to highlight a few of those um, for you today in the interest of time. Uh, the early childhood mental health consultation benefit we think would be particularly beneficial to young children who are struggling to be maintained in um, child care centers without support um, for child protection workers who are finding uh, young children with serious mental illnesses. And this consultation could bring partners in to help all of those other professionals do a good job with those children. Um, the American Indian Family Early Intervention Program is also a program that we think would show significant benefit to a community that is overrepresented in the child welfare system and especially in out of home placement. Um, the governor has funding for additional staff at DHS to provide monitoring and oversight for child protection work at the county level. We think this is important but certainly not sufficient to change practice. Um, the county's uh, social service funding, especially for child protection, has been cut over $40 million in the last 10 years. And I think we're seeing the results of those cuts in funding and the counties will need more funding in order to provide better services. You heard mention of the psychiatric residential treatment facilities proposal. This is something that's been recommended by three different task forces over the last five years. And we do see it as a critical addition to the continuum of care for children and adolescents. There are a couple of things that weren't in the governor's proposal that we're hoping you will consider this year. Um, we're grateful for the attention and the funding for the Homeless Youth Act that uh, it has received over the last few years. But those dollars are stretched um, in, in ways that make it very difficult for providers to provide substantial services to those young people. And especially in greater Minnesota, the funding that's been available has only been able to reach startups. Um, the uh, additional thing that, and we are working on, uh, with Representative Wills on a bill to provide some additional funding for the Homeless Youth Act. In addition, there is a growing awareness and concern on the part of homeless youth providers of the increased mental health needs of the young people that they are seeing. And we believe that um, a, a bill funding modeled on the school-linked mental health grants could be of substantial benefit to young people in those uh, shelter settings. So thank you very much. Thank you, Ms. Regan. Next up, we have Michael Scandrett from the Minnesota Safety Net Coalition. Welcome to the committee. Thank you, Mr. Chair, uh, members of the committee. My name is Michael Scandred. I'm here on behalf of the Minnesota Healthcare Safety Net Coalition. Now, the coalition is made up of nonprofit healthcare providers in Minnesota that uh, have a primary mission of serving low income, diverse, and disadvantaged populations. So that's their primary focus. And uh, the members of the coalition represent the full continuum of primary care, dental, mental health services, hospital, and specialty care. So the coalition is, brings together all parts of that safety net community that serves these special um, populations to work together on things that are important to all of them. The um, w one thing that is unique about the, the members is because of the characteristics of the patients serve, they often provide a lot of additional services, uh, tailor their services in ways to meet those needs that their uh, patients have and overcome the barriers that many of them have due to poverty race, ethnicity, um, homelessness, and so forth. So I'm gonna, again, as others had, I'm not gonna go through everything in the governor's budget that I like. Um, 
but we're going to focus on a couple that are especially uh, we wanted to emphasize and then a few areas of concern that we have in the budget. First of all, many people have testified and will testify on the mental health uh, provisions. We're very supportive of the governor's proposal in that area. It's a serious uh, issue. There's a lot of con needs and concerns out there, and this will go a long way towards addressing those. The second area of uh, strong support is one part of the governor's proposal on oral health, and that is the proposal for a base rate increase in the dental reimbursement rate. Uh, Minnesota enjoys, wrong word, uh, being last among the states in terms of the, uh, the rate that's paid to our uh, dentists that are providing care in our medical assistance program, and we think that needs to be addressed. I think everybody uh, around the table knows that dental access is a, is a big issue in Minnesota. So we really appreciate the governor bringing that forward, but we also have to raise a concern about another part of what the governor is proposing in the oral health area, and that is that they are proposing cuts to the special payments that are made to the nonprofit safety net providers that are intended to cover those added costs and special services, and the fact that a lot of the safety net providers uh, serve a lot of uninsured patients. So unfortunately, even with the base rate, rate increase, with the other cuts that are there, the uh, nonprofit safety net dental system will experience a net loss. And they're on the margins anyway. They're barely hanging on. Many of them have been close to closure over the next, uh, the last uh, couple of years. And uh, they just can't afford to take a cut. And just one example of uh, the impact, while it varies a lot from the different dental uh, providers, uh, we have one rural uh, uh, provider that uh, has calculated this as a 5% cut, which means about 1,000 patient visits a year that they will not be able to provide. So um, I'm just about out of time, so we'll just mention two areas that uh, we think something is missing from the budget, and uh, we plan to come back and, and talk to you later with some proposals. One is the remaining uninsured in Minnesota. There are some that are still... Uh, don't have the services they need and maybe in, in, with serious medical conditions and needing some help. And the other area is around health disparities where we think there should be more in the budget to uh, get at the issue of the disparities for racial and ethnic communities. And the first step is that, that is to improve the data that we have that can identify those disparities. And so we can do more to uh, bring those that experience poor quality and poor health up to uh, the great standards we have for all Minnesotans. So thank you. Thank you, Mr. Scandrett. Next up, we have uh, Mr. Ron Elwood from Legal Services Advocacy Project, and on deck, Steve Horsfield. Welcome to the committee. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and members of the committee, Ron Elwood with Legal Aid. Uh, as you know, Legal Aid represents low-income Minnesotans. Uh, many are very low-income, and we also represent elders and people with disabilities. Uh, the increases to the child care assistance program and the reduction in the basic sliding fee waiting list are, are sorely needed. CCAP and the basic sliding fee are essential and appropriate supports for those working parents raising families. It, they help Minnesotans to get jobs and keep jobs. Um, but some of what is uh, included in the governor's budget and also what's missing uh, would create further hardship for our clients, and I'll share just a couple of those in the few minutes I have. First, the proposed increase for the premium and out-of-pocket share will harm Minnesotans who are in Minnesota care. Not only would this proposal drain precious resources from struggling families, but it will also lead to higher medical debt and potential financial ruin for these families. And finally, as you've heard, just heard from Mr. Scandrett, the governor's budget does not address those remaining Minnesotans without insurance, and so therefore hospital emergency rooms will continue to treat conditions that might have been prevented had the patient had access to health coverage, despite the recommendations that were contained in the 2013 DHS EMA report, which have not been fulfilled. Thank you very much for your time. Thank you for your time with the committee, sir. Welcome to the committee. Good morning. Good afternoon, Mr. Chair and members of the committee. Thank you. Um, my name is Steve Horsfield. I'm the Executive Director of Simpson Housing Services. This morning I'm also speaking on behalf of more than, the more than 150 agencies that make up the Homes for All campaign. Uh, Simpson serves more than 400 families each evening, uh, families and individuals uh, who are formerly homeless through emergency shelter and through supportive housing programs. Uh, I came into this work personally about 10 years ago from a role where I managed operations in the private sector when I realized that fair access to safe and stable housing is not only a moral obligation, but is a good, makes good fiscal sense for our community. 
I'd like to begin my testimony this morning by commending the, our governor's recognition of the connection between uh, housing stability and mental health with his recommendation of an increase to support for adults with serious mental illness. So many people in our communities and families deal with mental health concerns, which are deeply exacerbated by housing instability and contribute to most cases of long-term homelessness. It is gratifying for me to see so many key leaders in our state recognizing the value of investing in housing stability. Housing is health care. Housing is employment building. Housing is education support. Housing is the infrastructure of our communities. The governor is also proposing a lot, a lot of reforms within DHS, and the success of those reforms will depend greatly on the housing stability of program participants, in particular those who face the most severe barriers to self-sufficiency. To put it another way, housing underpins many of the core functions of state government. We can increase funding for health care. We can incre increase funding for education, public safety, corrections, economic and work workforce development but we will not fully realize the full potential of those efforts if the people in, the, in those systems aren't having their housing needs met by first investing in a continuum of housing and services. Um, I'd like to, to thank Representative Hamilton for his work on the Homes for All, uh, the, the bill that contains many of the elements of Homes for All uh, that deals with emergency shelter, transitional housing, permanent supportive housing, the health care for um, adults with serious mental illness and the Homeless Youth, Youth Act. I would like that to uh, ask all of you to seriously consider the value proposition represented by that bill and what it means for all the rest of the programs in our state budget. Thank you very much for your time this morning. Thank you for your important work. Thank you. Uh, next up, we have Michelle Isham from the Deaf, Blind, and Hard of Hearing Minnesotans. Please come to the rostrum. And then on deck, we have uh, Mary Jo George for ARP. <coughs> Welcome to the committee. Please state your name and proceed with your testimony. And again, we've got about three minutes of testimony time. But uh, thank you for coming today. Thank you. Mr. Chair and committee members, my name is Michelle Isom. I'm the Vice Chair of the Commission of Deaf, Deafblind, and Hard of Hearing Minnesotans. I'm also hard of hearing. I live in St. Augusta, Minnesota, Representative Tice District. When creating his DHS budget, it appears that Governor Dayton overlooked the needs of deaf, deafblind, and hard of hearing Minnesotans. There are two areas in particular that I want to bring your attention to. The first is that he did not increase funds for the Deaf and Hard of Hearing Services Division, which is different from the Commission. The Deaf and Hard of Hearing Services Division provides direct service to our community and serves as a central point of entry for Deaf, Deafblind, and Hard of Hearing persons in need of services. Its budget has been cut over the years and <coughs> it is cutting back on needed services that are hurting the community. For example, Deaf Heart of Hearing Services Division has closed several of its regional offices, the ones in Rochester and Bemidji. Many deaf, deafblind, and hard of hearing Minnesotans do not have computers or internet service. With the regional offices closed, some in greater Minnesota can have to travel more than four hours one way to get the closest office and or the staff must travel that far to visit clients in their home. This distance can further isolate deaf and hard of hearing people in greater Minnesota. Another example of the budget cuts effect on the community is that there is currently a waiting list for deaf blind who need services. Without services, deaf blind Minnesotans can face complete isolation. The second area where deaf Minnesotans seem to have been overlooked is mental health services. Despite the proposed $35 million budget increase in the governor's budget for mental health services, there was no mention of the needs of children who are deaf, deaf, blind, and hard of hearing. There are at least 500 deaf children statewide who need mental health services. I urge you to increase funding for Deaf Heart of Hearing Services Division and to earmark some of the mental health funds for Deaf, Deaf Blind, and Heart of Hearing Minnesotans. Thank you for your time this afternoon. Thank you for your testimony. Next we have Mary Jo George from AARP. 
Welcome good, to the committee. Thank you. Good afternoon, Mr. Chairman, members of the committee. My name is Mary Jo George with AARP Minnesota, and on behalf of our nearly 700,000 members statewide, we appreciate the opportunity to testify today on the governor's budget. <coughs> I have a bit of a frog in my throat. Sorry about that. <coughs> Excuse me. Okay, let me start. For ERP, one of our top priorities this year, again, is focusing on policies that can support family caregivers. We want to begin then by thanking Governor Dayton for strengthening Medicaid, Medicaid laws that really look to improve the financial security of spouse caregivers when the other spouse is in need of expensive nursing home care. This is on page 113 of um, the governor's budget. And as you learned from um, the department uh, this past week, this pr proposal will bring our state law into conformity with federal law, as was determined in the Eighth Circuit court case. Just to provide you a little background on the policy for those who might not be aware, um, today elderly couples um, with defined pensions are able to retain some of that income for the spouse who's living in the community. Um, to live on, whereas couples with defined contribution plans, those plans like 401s or IRAs, uh, they have to spend down those assets. So under this proposal, that couple could convert that defined contribution to an annuitized income stream uh, so the community spouse would have ample money to live on. This most um, often affects elderly women in the community who outlive their husbands. And so we think this is an important uh, change because of the decline in defined pension benefits. The second thing I think is important for folks to know is that the state is named as the first beneficiary if there are any remaining funds upon the death of the community spouse and the institutional, uh, institutionalized spouse. So any remaining funds would be eligible for what we call Medicaid estate recovery and the state would potentially be reimbursed for these costs. Another important issue that we support that but unfortunately wasn't funded in the governor's budget is the policy to increase the MA income standard. I think you heard about that from other testifiers, uh, so I won't go into that, but we do think this policy is really important if we want people to continue to live uh, in the community and to age in place. We have to start looking at these eligibility issues as a whole. <clears throat> Third, we want to lend our support to the proposal in the governor's budget related to own your own future. Uh, ERP has been involved with this group. We do think it's going to be important. We develop new long-term care insurance products because of the limitations in the market today. Um, however, having said that, we were disappointed to see that there isn't more critical support for um, investments in both our home and community-based providers and our nursing home uh, care in our nursing homes because we really think it's important in order to retain and recruit a quality workforce. And then finally, I'll just say that we are very concerned about the premium increases to the Minnesota CARE program. And that's it. Thank you. Thank you so much, Ms. <coughs> George. Next up, we have Mary Krinke from the Minnesota Hospitals Association and on deck, Sarah Greenfield. Welcome to the committee, Ms. Krinke. Thank you, Mr. Chair and members of the committee. And unlike former Representative Lauren Solberg, I'm really happy to be in this committee here today. So uh, it's a pleasure to be back in the new year. So uh, my name is Mary Krinke, and I'm with the Minnesota Hospital Association. And we represent 143 hospitals statewide and the health care systems of our state. There is a key hospital provision kind of buried in there on page 135 of the governor's budget that will benefit 79 of our critical access hospitals in the state. Critical access hospitals are hospitals that have less than 25 beds. This is a federal designation. And this was a recommendation from the department in light of the budget neutral rebasing of hospital rates that was passed last session. So we are moving our base year in the Medicaid program from 2002 to 2012 and the department is very concerned that this could have some uh, potentially harmful impacts on our rural hospitals and I just want to mention that for most of our rural hospitals they have about 50 percent of their patients are on Medicare and then about 12 percent on Medicaid so it's a very high percentage of their business that is government payer. Uh, like many of the other speakers today, the Hospital Association is very pleased with the governor's budget recommendations in the mental health area. 
and primarily the community-based mental health services, not the hospital-based mental health services. Um, we know that that is where the greatest need is. Oftentimes, as, as we've heard already today, people access mental health services in the emergency room because they don't know where else to go. And uh, they have a tendency to have long periods of stay because there are not a lot of discharge options available out in the community. Often when those discharge options are found, they're miles and miles away from home and the family support system. I just want to mention three specifics in the governor's mental health budget that uh, the hospital association strongly supports. The first one is the creation and adoption and greater use of behavioral health homes. Um, I know that Kathy Knight from Fairview mentioned this. Um, this is a, similar to the health care homes that were passed in the 2008 re bipartisan reform legislation here in Minnesota. This will integrate both physical health care needs with serious mental health needs. And we believe that if patients can get their um, health care needs all in one location, th this will be very advantageous to the patients. A pilot project was done in New York State, and they found 15% fewer ER, 15% fewer use of the ER, and a whopping 45% reduction in inpatient mental health needs if someone had a behavioral health home that they could go to on a regular basis and felt like they had consistency with a mental health provider. The second one that I want to mention is funding for crisis team capacity. So they're going to be working on uh, doing a 1-800 number as well as um, uh, mobile care units. Uh, the last one to mention in light of the time is the um, intensive residential treatment services. This will be a residential component similar to what we have at Anoka County. Oftentimes hospitals don't have discharge options and so we get a backup of violent patients in, um, in our hospitals. So with that, Mr. Chairman, we look forward to working with the committee. Thank, Thank you very you, much. Thank you, Ms. Trinke. And before we let you go, Representative McDonald has a question for you. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Ms. Krinke, uh, out of that 15 percent reduction in the emergency room, uh, what percentage, if at all, uh, was attributed to uh, the dental? Perhaps they uh, were referred to a, a dentist as, in, as opposed to the uh, emergency room. Ms. Krinke. Uh Mr. Chairman and uh, Representative McDonald, um, we can get you some numbers on people who access dental care in the hospital emergency rooms. Um, we can tell that by our codes and I can get you that information. What we were referring to with the reduction of 15 percent was for folks who have a um, behavioral health home uh, dealing with their mental health issues. So the dental issue was not really directly involved with that percentage. I can get you that information. Thanks for the clarification, Ms. Krinke. Next up we have Sarah Greenfield. <coughs> Welcome to the committee. Thank you, Mr. Chair, members of the committee. Uh, my name is Sarah Greenfield. I'm the healthcare program manager at Take Action Minnesota. Take Action is a grassroots network of people and organizations around the state working on various issues of social, racial, and economic justice. And our healthcare program has worked for many years to expand access to healthcare by engaging people in policy change and more recently in outreach and, and referral to enrollment assistance. Through that work in our other program areas, we speak daily with low and middle income Minnesotans around the state who are directly impacted by healthcare reform and who are trying to get by. We support many of the governor's proposed investments in health and low-income families, many that have been mentioned today. One I'd like to highlight that hasn't been mentioned is the um, continued support for Minsher. We've seen many benefits from beginning to have one enrollment location for both public and private uh, coverage, and making that system work smoothly is a worthy investment in the future of coverage in Minnesota. We are, however, concerned about the governor's proposed cost increases to Minnesota care enrollees. While we strongly agree with the governor's statements that he makes in the budget about the importance of Minnesota care to our state, we know that there is no trivial cost increase for people at this income level. Many enrollees are parents, many are low-income workers, many are, uh, like John, who's going to join me in a moment, workers who are not yet seeing a bounce back from the recession. We hope that as session progresses, uh, and your discussions continue, you will find ways to preserve the incredibly important Minnesota Care program and not increase costs for enrollees. Thank you, Ms. Greenfield. 
Mr. John Hesch uh, from Take Action Minnesota. Welcome to the committee. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Chair, representatives, my name is John Hesch. I live in Minnetonka. I worked 17 years for the same company, during which time I discovered I was diabetic. Uh, I just was managing my diabetes with pills when my company relocated and moved out of state, and so I lost my job. So I was offered a COBRA uh, at 750 a month. Unfortunately, that would have been more than my house payment, my uh, gas and electric bill. So I thought I'll get my own plan, no big deal, right? So of course, what I didn't realize is the fact that I had a pre-existing condition, they wouldn't insure me. So I was without health insurance for two years. In 2014, I enrolled through Minsure and qualified for Minnesota Care. Uh, I was very happy about that. I'm, I'm at the top of the MinCare eligibility which means I make about 2,000 a month, including Social Security and also a part-time job as an anger management facilitator. Right now I'm paying about $600 for my coverage. On my first visit back to the doctor uh, without having health insurance for two years, I discovered that my diabetes was no longer under control with pills and I should have been on insulin instead. As a result of that, um, I was hospitalized for six weeks, during which time I also lost my toe as a result of that. Um, but thankfully, I did have the Minnesota Care. Uh, I hate to think what would have happened if I didn't have coverage for hospitalization for a six-week stay. Um, like many people at my income level, my budget is tight every month. Uh, I pay 900 for rent, 300 for food, utilities and transportation around $400. So I'm not able really to save on that budget. Being able to afford health care at $50 a month has really been a godsend for me. I am grateful for Governor Dayton's leadership to make Minnesota care strong in recent years. And I ask you all to consider the real impact on low-income folks of any cost increase to the premiums of that program. Uh, I think without Minnesota Care, I would have become much more ill and disabled. And uh, I'm back on my feet for the last two weeks, and so uh, I'm very grateful. <coughs> Thank you. Thank you for your testimony, Mr. Hesch. And next up, we have Mr. Paul Goring from Mental Health Services of Alina. Welcome to the committee. Mr. Chair, members of the committee, thank you for inviting my testimony. My name is Paul Gehring. I'm a psychiatrist at United and the vice president of the mental health service line at Alina, where we have 305 inpatient mental health beds serving children, adolescents, adults, and geriatric patients. We also have a large integrated primary care network. I'd like to thank the committee and the governor for the attention to mental health, which you've heard a lot of this afternoon and share uh, just a little bit about which proposals would afford us the opportunity to both more efficiently provide those acute care beds to the community, but also be better stewards of the limited resources offered in this budget. Uh, as you're aware, we're pretty stuck in this evolution of moving from a mental health care system that's rooted in institutional care and provided by and paid for by the state to one that's community-based and has a broad spectrum of services that are timely and reliable and really limit the use of inpatient beds, which are the most expensive and most scarce to those who truly have a need. <coughs> I believe our citizens deserve that, but certainly it's not the case at current. And I know it's not the case because every morning I get a page at 8 a.m. telling me how many patients are in our 15 emergency rooms waiting for inpatient services and they can't access, access them because our beds are full. And really, there are two broad groups of resources that would allow us more efficiently to use those beds and serve the community. Um, and they're pain points for us. Right now, the a lesser level of care in the community and the infrastructure simply is not mature and reliable to be able to let us move patients from inpatient locations to the community in a timely way. And the second is the difficulty in moving patients to safety net hospital beds when they're committed to the commissioner. 
that problem has been greatly uh, challenged in the last year with the 48-hour rule in three ways. Our length of stay has been uh, greatly increased with our inpatient all uh, frequently being bumped uh, up to four months on waiting lists for those beds. We're also taking beds out of commission in double rooms where violent and agitated patients waiting for safety net beds are waiting and the boarding is at an unprecedented precedented level where patients are waiting in the emergency room for their care to be initiated. Um, it, it's not very adequate. But a number of things in the budget, you've heard them today already that the governor's identified, uh, really merit support. And they are the investments that expand ERTS facilities, supportive housing, integrated mental health and chemical dependency treatment, and uh, our workforce growth, especially around graduate med medical education for uh, psychiatric residents. There are two notes of caution I'd like to ask. Uh, the f we provide services in a lot of counties and we have great difficulty in the variability of type and uh, administrative processes to access those services. Any improvement in the consistency would greatly uh, uh, improve our ability to consistently serve those clients. And finally, I am concerned about those items and proposals that create greater demand where definitive service capacity does not yet exist. And I particularly call out any bed closures that I have not had alternate resources identified. I'd like to thank you for your time and I'd be happy to answer any questions. Thank you for your testimony, Doctor. We appreciate that. Uh, next up we have Mark Casagranda. And on deck, John Seymour. Welcome to the committee. Thank you, Mr. Chairman uh, and members of the committee. My name is Mark Casagrande, and I am the president of MARCH, which stands for Minnesota Association of Resources for Recovery and Chemical Health. MARCH with two R's, a lot easier. Uh, MARCH is the trade organization for substance abuse treatment providers within the state. We represent the 350 plus uh, providers who employ a approximately 20,000 employees serving the approximately 50,000 clients each year. Uh, March is here asking you for four things. First, please support the 10% rate increase for chemical dependency treatment, known as the FROG initiative. We've met with several of you and uh, we plan to meet with all of you. Uh, we do have proposed legislation and my colleague John Seymour is gonna talk about that, um, but please support that. Uh, the second thing, is to please support DHS's proposed legislation for IDDT complex. I'll talk a little bit more about that. It's kind of a nuanced thing, but we're asking for your support on that. The third thing is to support DHS's proposed legislation for withdrawal management, also known as detox. Uh, and the fourth thing is to support the 10% rate increase. All right, I'm asking for three things, but the rate increase is really important to us. Um, so the DHS proposed legislation on IDDT complex. In the governor's proposed budget, it looks like it's funding for chemical dependency treatment. It's actually a very narrow sliver, specifically focusing on clients that are under commitment for chemical dependency to the commissioner. Uh, we support this proposed legislation. The idea of this legislation is to esta establish standards, staffing patterns, and funding for chemical dependency providers to take on these clients who are under full commitment. Clients under such a commitment are by definition a danger to themselves and require more resources than clients who are not under such a, such a commitment. The proposed legislation is necessary to establish the standards and a separate rate for community providers that can serve these clients. Uh, as DHS proposes to reduce the number of beds within the care system, the state hospital system, these steps are absolutely necessary in order to be able to shift these clients to community-based providers. However, with the limited options specifically in Greater Minnesota, uh, March has expressed significant concerns about the proposal to close these care facilities. Uh, it, if you're not familiar, they're proposing closing 100 of the 174 beds. This is of great concern to us. We voice that concern and to our pleasure, uh, DHS has reached out and we're meeting with them to create options to accommodate these clients. Uh, March would also ask you to support DHS's proposed legislation regarding with, withdrawal management. 
historically referred to as detox withdrawal management has, is a significant issue throughout the state and impacts law enforcement, emergency rooms, and the jails. By allowing the division to establish these standards for withdrawal management, the proposed legislation is necessary first step to expand these services beyond the traditional uh, offerings. Uh, thank you very much for your time, and I'm going to turn it over to John to talk about the frog. Please support it. Thanks. Thank you, Mr. Casagranda. Uh, Mr. Seymour. And the frog. The frog. Welcome to the committee. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Chair and members, thank you for the opportunity to testify, testify before you today. My name is John Seymour, and I am representing FROG. FROG stands for Fair Reimbursement and Outcomes Group and is a coalition of advocates from all over Minnesota who are committed to delivering and investing in cost-effective uh, chemical dependency treatment. We are seeking fair reimbursement for chemical dependency treatment services in Minnesota to maintain and increase access to high-quality, cost-effective care that will be tied to reduced ER visits, hospital stays, and incarceration. This represents an estimated $25 million over two years to invest in what is deemed cost-effective care by DHS. Addiction impacts one in three families, and this proposal represents an investment in and a win for individuals, families, and the economy and budget of Minnesota. So who are we, uh, who does FROG represent? Um, it's cute, uh, I know that. Um, our constituent, uh, constituency includes chemical dependency and treatment providers representing over 350 providers throughout the state, both locally and throughout the state. Uh, a workforce of over 20,000 people and uh, 50,000 patients who we treat on an annual basis. We are also representing one-third of all Minnesota families, 700,000 Minnesota families who are impacted by drug and alcohol addiction. Our clients are like you and me, seeking sobriety to make a better life for themselves. Uh, their children and their families. They are grandmothers, granddaughters, mothers, fathers, sons and daughters, sisters and brothers, aunts and uncles and friends. They all struggle with addiction. They know they need help. They also need hope. Why is this a critically important issue and in investment to the state of Minnesota? First off, it represents an investment in families, individuals in the state of Minnesota. Chemical dependency impacts one in three families, yet 90% of those that affected re receive either inadequate or no treatment at all. Not effectively treating chemical dependency costs society over $400 billion per year, according to the Office of National Drug Control Policy. In Minnesota, it costs $7 billion per year. This doesn't include the human cost and toll on families and societies. Chemical dependency treatment providers are increasingly treating more complex clients who are highly vulnerable and require more services and are reliant on public funding for care, while at the same time, reimbursement rates are over 40% below inflation or the CPI, are, are basically our cost of uh, delivering care. And reimbursement, reimbursement rates lag the cost <laughs> of delivery of care despite the fact that research strongly supports what we do. Okay, time. Okay, what we do works. Chemical dependency, uh, we see there's a return on investment of 12 to 1. Uh, largely, these savings are in reduced health care and criminal justice costs. Uh, we're also helping to keep families intact. So thank you for your time, and we hope to get your support for a critical a cause that will help impact one in three families. Thank you, Mr. Seymour. And Representative Grunhagen has a question. Uh, just a general comment. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. The, you know, I have to meet with a constituent here, so I have to leave, but I just want to make an observation. You know, these all appear to be worthy, you know, uh, organizations that are trying to help people. But, you know, just one observation, you know, I count one, two, three, about seven different ones that deal with uh, mental health or uh, behavioral health or something like that. Is, you know, what we see in the private sector, we see consolidation in many cases where you cut your overhead cost and then you're more efficient and more effective. Is there any way... You know, there seems like, it seems a little, and I'm a lay person, it seems a little fragmented here. <laughs> I mean, everybody wants more money, I understand that. But the thing is, and there's just not enough money to go around, but the point is, 
you know, if some of these organizations would consolidate or work together, they might find that they're, they could cut their overhead cost and uh, be more effective. Just an observation. Could be wrong, but I'm generally right. <laughs> Except when I'm at home. No. Thank you, Representative Thank you, Grunenhagen. Thank you, Mr. Seymour. Thank you. Thank you, Frog. Oh, Frog's, Frog's oh, still there. Don't forget Frog. Yeah, he doesn't get three minutes. All right. Uh, Ms. Phillips is up next, and Amanda Capes next. Good afternoon, Mr. Welcome Chair. Welcome to the committee. Thank you, and I do have handouts that are being handed out right now. I'm Sue Watlow Phillips. I'm the president and CEO of Integrated Community Solutions, a for-profit consulting company. I'm a retired psychologist and over the last 45 years have been advocating with people um, impacted by discrimination, especially people in poverty and experiencing homelessness for structural solutions to provide equitable opportunities for all. Some of you may know me that have been around for a while that I was the executive director of uh, Elam Transitional Housing and a shelter for over 30 years also. What I'm here to talk about um, in, in the first page as you're getting it right now and some of you are getting it um, as, I'm, as I'm talking about and I know I'm gonna talk quickly, is to talk about equity and really investing our tax resources wisely. My parents as well as my faith teaches me that uh, we are to love and treat others the way that we wanna be treated and the way we treat ourselves. So when we talk about equity, it's not only that all of us need our shoes and boots today to run around in that mess that we're gonna be running around in a few minutes, is that we all need shoes and boots that fit us. And that's what equity is all about, is making sure that we have equitable opportunities for all folks within our community. So one of the things that came out of the Department of Human Services was an equity analysis, which is this green sheet um, that is just the first sheet in, in your handout, if you don't mind taking the paper clip off and just joining me as I walk through them very quickly, is that we really need to do an equity analysis of each bill, just like we do the fiscal analysis, to see how much it costs us, is are we increasing equity and opportunities for folks to take care of themselves, or are we increasing disparities? On the back side, it talks about why it's so important that we do that as an economy. Uh, both in the metro area as well as across the state, we see from the Minneapolis Federal Reserve and others, is that if we don't address the inequities and the disparities in our state, is that we are hurting ourselves and our, our tax base by not addressing that. As you can see, children in poverty are overrepresented by people of color and all the disparities in home ownership, homelessness, uh, poverty, uh, in, in ability to access home ownership opportunities, rental housing are, are overrepresented by, by people of color. I encourage you to look at the health equity report and look at the disparities, especially pages 80 to, to 90 or so. The next sheet in is a yellow sheet, and that's been talked about a little bit. It's way past due uh, to increase the public assistance grants on MFIP. If you look on the back side of that sheet, you'll see that there is no place in the state that you can afford a two-bedroom apartment for a family that's on MFIP at 532. We are continuing to put our, our, our families at risk of experiencing homelessness. And we have to decide, how do we want to invest our dollars? Under our, our program, the MFIP program, um, may I just do one more moment or two? Okay. Under the MFIP program, um, basically, we spend a great deal of money on emergency shelters. That costs us four to $5,000 for a family for one month. So if we use that money over um, a year's period, we could increase the MFIP grant by 300 to 400. And then the final, which you probably have already looked at, is you know you, you might be kind of overwhelmed already by all the information that you're getting. One of the things I've been overwhelmed with is the HMIS program. Anybody know what that is? Okay, well that's a program we've had in the state for 12 years that we're using tax dollars for that you don't know about, and it's data collection that. Um, is not, not information that we're using on a regular basis. I encourage you to look through this and thank you for the time to speak. Thank you for your testimony. Uh, I'm sorry, uh, Representative McDonald. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Ms. Uh, Phillips, is that right? Yes, sir. Uh, what, Love Phillips? Yes, sir. Uh, you mentioned something about shoes, did you not? Yes. Shoes? And um, question, uh, you're probably familiar with the Souls for Souls mm -hmm. program? Yes. And uh, for, so in your organization, do you, uh, have that opportunity to take it to uh, to accept those donations of shoes and then not necessarily use the money then from the state to help uh, the other areas of your program 
Uh, for, for, for Integrated Community Solutions, it's, it's a consulting company. I can say that I'm also part, I'm the executive director of MICA and Amanda speaking from, from MICA. But um, we um, work with direct services in the community that takes donations that then help in, in providing uh, those types of things so that uh, we don't need to use in state dollars to assist uh, with those types of things. So obviously uh, having private public um, faith-based connections uh, can really reduce the costs that we are uh, then using of government resources. Mr. Chair. Representative McDonald. And just shortly, because I know we are almost out of time, but there's only a few uh, testifiers. Well, that's the, the ticket, and you just said it beautifully, that the private uh, market mixed with faith-based organizations coming together and uh, filling a void, helping out problems, coming up with solutions to all the good people that are here, and that's what uh, we certainly need to take advantage of and uh, encompass and foster that there's more of that. So uh, similar to the Souls for Souls, if you're, maybe everybody knows about it, you donate shoes, and uh, thousands and thousands, truckloads of shoes, not only in Minnesota, but they go out of state to Haiti and uh, other areas. Uh, but that's what we need, really need to do is focus on the faith, faith, nonprofit groups uh, to come together to fill the voids and come up with solutions. Because we at the state, as you know, dollars are short, and they can only go so far. But the faith, faith, the generosity of the Minnesotan people, the Minnesotans, is larger than life. And they'll always come in to fill that void. And Mr. Chair, uh, Representative, um, we, we can fill a portion of the void, but we need our, our, our dollars that we are providing to the state to assist in, in making uh, the needs uh, met within our community. Thank you so much. Uh, Representative Liebling. Thank you, um, Mr. Chair. And don't leave yet. I, actually, I was going to give you a sort of a softball question. Okay. I was going to say, you know, it's true. We have very gen Minnesotans are extremely generous. I think I have some of the most generous ones in the state in my own district. But how well is that helping the 70,000 children who are in extremely deep poverty on our federal, on our, sorry, on our state MFIP program? Well, Mr. Mr. Chair and Representatives, um, certainly the, the faith-based community is helping where it can, but we do need to use our tax dollars and our TANF dollars that come through as IMFIP in Minnesota to increase those resources so people can afford housing. It doesn't make, it doesn't make any sense not to have people stable in housing so children can go to school, people can get jobs, and they can move very quickly off of that program. Thank you. And next up, we have Amanda Kappas from the Metropolitan Interfaith Council on Affordable Housing. Welcome to the committee. Thank you, Mr. Chair and committee members for allowing me to testify today. My name is Amanda Kappas. I'm the policy coordinator for Metropolitan Council on Affordable Housing. First of all, I'd like to give you a, a little bit of my background. Uh, about 21 years ago, I was actually a recipient of the AFDC program and a part of the STRIDE program, which was an educational um, support system uh, for pa parents on AFDC. I started my education in Central Lakes Community College, and even prior to my graduation, I accepted a full-time position as a public assistance financial worker. So I was able to see both sides of the desk um, as far as it comes to the public assistance programs. Um, one thing of great concern, uh, as we've heard today, is the, the lack of cash assistance to the families that our, our state is assisting with. Um, I was very appreciative uh, during my time through college that I had child care assistance and I still greatly appreciate that the governor has put increases into that budget as I can uh, see myself as a success story because I had those benefits at the time I needed them, accepted full-time employment and uh, have been off the system since and been able to help other families in that situation. Um, when we look at the word MFIP, or the acronym MFIP, it stands for Minnesota Family Investment Program. We need to make sure that we're investing our dollars effectively. And when a family is worried about if they're sleeping on a couch or in a car or jumping from house to house or eviction notice, they are not stable to focus on those educational opportunities, the, the job opportunities, or making sure that their children are stable in school. 
So I would, um, would strongly appreciate all of your support in looking at if there's any dollars in the budget to increase those grant assistance. It's like I said, we need to ensure that we are investing our dollars where it is appropriate to make sure that families can go to school, get to their jobs, and take care of their families. So all these programs work together effectively. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony, Ms. Kappas. We appreciate that. And next up, we have Cisa Keller from the Minnesota Child Care Association. Welcome to the committee. Hello, Mr. Chair and members of the committee. Thank you for taking the time to listen to all of us. I know I'm the last one on, so I will make this quick. Um, I just am here on behalf of the Minnesota Child Care Association. The Child Care Association represents about 250 licensed child care centers throughout the state of Minnesota. Um, and we're here to talk about the governor's budget and specifically the components around the child care assistance program. Uh, the research is clear that uh, investing in early childhood education has great benefits for both uh, individuals for families and for the state and so we're really excited that the governor has put some significant investments into early childhood education specifically around three uh, areas in the child care assistance budget um, the first is a simplification um, effort in trying to make the child care assistance program less compl uh, less complicated and less burdensome for families so we're excited about that he put some additional dollars around trying to reduce the basic sliding fee um, and he also put some dollars into continuing the parent aware uh, quality rating and improvement system and we support uh, support all of those initiatives but we really see these as just a first step um, into trying to do more I want to focus on three areas that we would like to see additional um, uh, conversations around first is an effort to again simplify the child care assistance program we would like to look at trying to move eligibility for child care assistance to a 12 month process currently families have to reauthorize um, turn in paperwork every three three to six months and we know this is very cumbersome for families um, and can be devastating for children and so we're looking to actually make this into a 12 month process which is actually a recommendation from the federal um, child office of child care Next, we would also like to support what you've heard from many others around fully funding the basic sliding fee. These are families that are income eligible, that are ready to work, um, but are not able to receive the one benefit that they need to go to work, and this is child care assistance. Minnesota is one of just a few states that actually has a wait list. Most other states actually fund this completely. And then finally, we want to talk about the reimbursement rates. Uh, Minnesota is very, very behind in the, re in the reimbursement rates for child care assistance. Um, child care in general is a private market. Um, the government actually only subsidizes about 10 to 15 percent of the child care market. And so this is a private marketplace, and we just want to be able to um, make sure that families that are using child care assistance can actually use it the way that the rest of the um, Minnesota is using it. So with that, I just want to thank you for taking the time to hear from us um, and thank many of the uh, members on this committee that we know are huge champions in this issue. So thank you. Thank you, Ms. Keller, and thank you to all of the testifiers today, the direct care providers and the advocates representing them and all of the Minnesotans that you serve. We do appreciate it, and we will have continued testimony tomorrow on the governor's budget and look forward to uh, the committee. also want to thank the committee members' time uh, today in listening to the testimony. We do appreciate that. Thank you so very much, and we are adjourned.